Are you struggling to find mental health clinicians to work for your group practice or agency? Tired of posting job ads for your open roles only to have no response? Or worse, have the wrong individual apply for the role? What if you had a partner who understood both the intricate requirements and career arc of a mental health clinician and how to recruit them more efficiently to work for your organization? Sparrow Search Services is a behavioral health-focused recruiting firm that utilizes their staff expertise as practicing mental health clinicians to source and engage other mental health clinicians who may be open to making a career upgrade. Reach out to Sparrow today via their website, sparrowsearchservices.com to see how they can help you. Mention keyword Joe in your message to receive $500 off your first placement. Again, that's sparrowsearchservices.com and use promo code Joe to get that discount. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Andrew Burdett, and I'm one of the consultants with Practice at the Practice. I own a small hybrid group practice based out of Asheville, North Carolina, and we provide some in-person and mostly telehealth across the state of North Carolina and to some additional states as well. I really enjoy helping practice owners set up and manage a set of systems that work well for them, both in efficiency and cost effectiveness. I also really like to help find ways to maximize how they currently work so that they can spend more time engaging what they love to do outside of therapy and the therapy process. You can schedule a pre-consulting call with me at practicethepractice.com slash apply and I look forward to meeting with you sometime soon. All right, hello and thanks for joining us. This is episode 925 with Angela Brooks Livingston. Uh, Today, we're talking about clinical supervision, social justice work, and how to bring allyship into counseling. So Angela, first up, thanks for being on the podcast. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your journey into counseling as a career and kind of how that came to be? And then since, since entering this field, kind of what you've done to be a counselor and ultimately a supervisor? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, So how did I become a counselor? Well, um, yeah. I was working at Target. I'd gone to undergrad and was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And a very dear friend of mine who you've had on this podcast, Kim Skelton, was a therapist. And I did some volunteer work with her, um, this little like camp thing she was doing um, when we both were living in Atlanta, Georgia. And she just, she was like, you know, I really think you should think about being a counselor. and so I thought about it and I talked to her some about it and thought, yeah, that sounds like I think I could do that. And um, so started researching, looking at different avenues to being a counselor and um, decided on um, clinical mental health. And so uh, applied to some schools in North Carolina and got into Appalachian State and started there in 2009 and um to 2011 and then after i graduated i worked uh, about eight and a half years in community mental health and uh, felt like i don't know we were august of 2020 into the pandemic and it's like this isn't working i felt very much like i had come to the end of my time in community mental health for a lot of reasons and so did all the things I had to do to start my private practice. And here I am three years later doing private work, doing um, individual couples supervision. Um, Yeah. Reader's Digest version. That's what my journey looks like. (laughs) (laughs) So again, friend of yours. And again, Kim's awesome. um, But just kind of was like, Hey, this seems like, I don't know. I do this. It's kind of interesting. Maybe you should check it out too. And, just looked into it, huh? Yeah, she, Kim and I are very similar in ways. We're also very different in ways, but I think she picked up on some stuff. And we, even before that, we had known each other. I mean, Kim and I have known each other for, gosh, probably over 20 years at this point. And so, um, so she knew me and she knew kind of my background and, 
um, you know, of course I had commiserated with her. I was like, oh, I don't like working at Target. I don't, you know, I don't want to do this. I want to do something that's, you know, fulfilling and um, helps other people in a meaningful way. And then, yeah, so I talked to her about, you know, what's it like for you to be a therapist and what does that entail? And, um, yeah, the more we talked about it, it just felt like, yeah, that that feels like it aligns with my values of what the work I want to do. So, um, yeah, so with her encouragement, yeah, applied to some programs and here we are. For those out here listening, Kim's um, interviewing her, her have already interviewed her. She's coming up on a future episode of the podcast and a couple episodes to talk about ketamine assisted treatment and um, all the psychedelic assisted stuff and maps and stuff. So stay tuned and check out that interview coming up in a few episodes. But in the meantime, let's get back to super being kind of stuff. Um, so after was it in school or was it after school to where you kind of looked at supervision as something else you wanted to kind of learn about, maybe develop some skills into and possibly pursue as an additional layer to your career? So I, in school, I was looking towards that. Um, and, um, what that would mean as a professional. And for me, it felt even in graduate school, it felt that would be a natural progression for me. Um, so I did take a course in supervision in graduate school. Honestly, it wasn't the best. And so um, after I, I made my time, you know, according to the board, um, they told me this is where the board needs to really do better. Um, when I called the board about applying for my S they told me it was five years post-graduation. Apparently that's not true anymore. Um, A lot of people who've reached out to me have said the board's telling them it's five years post-associate license. So um, so I got in under a different interpretation of of the statute. So, and I was doing... um, even before I got my S, I was doing, I was a site supervisor for App State. So I had interns, practicum and internship students, and got some good feedback. Um, students saying they liked the way I did supervision. They liked my style. Um, they felt comfortable in coming to supervision, appreciated how I gave feedback. And so, again, yeah, it just felt like a natural progression. Um, so when I was able to, I did all the, I took a institute, um, with Dr. Christina Rosen and was much better, uh, than the course I took and yeah, did my S and have felt that's a, that's a way I can give back to the field is making sure at least the ones that come to me, um, are trained and ethical and know how to be a counselor um, and that they have the skills to go out and not need regular supervision. So So it sounds like the clinical supervisor journey happened after being in a more administrative kind of capacity Mm -hmm. to where you're already a leader at a particular setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Leadership has been something I've gravitated towards my whole life. And so when I was at the agency, I did some uh, changed positions a little bit. And yeah, I ended up doing some more uh, admin supervision. So like qualified professionals, um, peer support specialists that I could supervise, you know, without needing to license because they weren't licensed people they just needed according to the state definition you know they needed somebody more experienced in the field to do their supervision within the agency so I was already doing some of that and was still connected to App State and so when we started getting interns where I was working then 
I took on some interns and, um, so yeah, that kind of was already there. And then once I got my supervisor license, then I was, of course, with an, at an agency, I was getting, I had several licensure, uh, supervisees and, and, and was still doing admin supervision for other folks. But, um, yeah, I started more licensure supervision once I got that, the S from the board. So you've kind of used a couple different adjectives to describe different kinds of supervision. Do you want to talk a bit about admin supervision first, I guess, because that's, that covers a lot, but that's not really the focus of the podcast. And then we can kind of get into how clinical supervision is really different and get more in depth with that. So can you clarify for the listeners out there, like what admin supervision is and the kind of roles or titles you might see somebody with that responsibility and then move into to licensure supervision? Sure. I will say that probably depending on your setting, admin supervision may look a little bit different, but in my setting, admin supervision was a, kind of what it sounds like, administrative supervision. So, um, you know, holding people accountable, they got their notes done on time, that treatment plans are in date, that uh, if we're audited, you know, things are corrected like they're supposed to, everything's completed at the intake that's supposed to be, you know, um, doing more, holding people accountable and giving feedback and things like that related to direction from the agency, policies that we have in place, um, or requirements from the LME MCO or the state BHHS that says, okay, if, you know, this client's in an enhanced service, they got to do the NC tops, they got to do, you know, the SASE or, you know, whatever. Um, and then it, it's sort of, I mean, I guess you consider it admin supervision when it's, with yeah qualified professionals and peer support so um you know just making sure that again their documentation and all that's like it's supposed to be that they're working within their own boundaries and competence and um that they're getting feedback uh from somebody who's got more experience in the field so yeah admin supervisions i mean it's important it's kind of boring sometimes. It sounds almost a bit more on the managerial and accounting side mm -hmm. of stuff than necessarily like the clinical skills side of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely um, more, yeah, kind of a manager-ish kind of situation. Um, yeah, it's where clinical supervision, you know, is very different. You know, clinical supervision, I'm training somebody to be a counselor, you know, to be able to be out there and not, and not have that A behind their, behind their letters. So for me, of course, there's more liability uh, with being somebody's licensure, clinical supervisor. Um, but also it's a greater responsibility that, because um, a lot of things come up around clinical supervision, whether that's particular interventions you want to use, if that's transference and counter-transference, if that's your own mental health or substance use for the supervisee, um, all of that comes up in clinical supervision. And so there's a greater, I feel a greater responsibility when I'm doing clinical or licensure supervision than when I'm doing admin supervision. Um. So how I kind of worded this question was acknowledging there's a lot of overlap between the administrative side of things if you're supervising in that capacity yeah. versus the licensure level supervision. So is it easier to describe how they differ from how they're the same or is it easier to just describe the notable differences between the two? I don't know. I mean, the, it can get tricky when you're having to do both as a person working in an agency you know, if somebody was working in my same center, especially if they were in child services, which was my area that I was responsible for as far as the admin supervision side. If I had a provisionally licensed intensive in-home team lead, then I was both. I was their admin supervisor and their clinical supervisor. And so 
there were times I had to just flat out say, okay, this is, I need to see you for a second, but this is admin stuff. And then other times it's like, we got to have a clinical conversation, you know? And so it, it could get tricky sometimes. Um, most of the time it was fine. Um, but there were times I had to make a distinct, like I'm coming to you now as your admin supervisor, like, Hey, you know, this documentation is not right. Or, you know, your, your notes have been late for a week or, Hey, you know, you didn't get that note in, in seven days, we didn't get paid for that intensive in-home session. You know I mean? It's like that kind of stuff. Right. Whereas on the clinical side, you know, I may talk to them about how do you engage families who are burned by the system, you know, and that's more, how do you build rapport and, you know, that kind of stuff. I could definitely see where being a clinical director and clinical supervisor of the same people in the same place would definitely introduce some, some ethical decision-making around, am I, where do I need to place priorities first? Like, is it to serve the institution we're all working in, or is it to serve the licensure level stuff? And I guess for the, the people out there that happen to be wearing both of those hats, so the administrative and clinical supervisory roles, like any thoughts on how to walk through that process and where priorities really should be? That, yeah, that's a hard dance because in, in both, in your admin supervision and your clinical supervision, the priority, the first priority is the client. And so it's kind of both in that instance. And so for me, it was more about, okay, where's the greatest risk or danger? You know, I mean, if it came between needing to talk to them about, you know, shitty note writing or I they've got a client in crisis well of course I'm going to go with we got to deal with the crisis first we can deal with shitty note writing whenever we get to it I mean you know so um yeah it, it's a it's a dance between um serving what you need to as a as an admin supervisor sometimes because some of that's connected to getting paid and you know, keeping the agency afloat and, you know, all that stuff. And then the clinical supervision is about kind of the gatekeeping of the field. You know, it's that if I put my name on that final supervision report and say, yes, I recommend this person as a unrestricted licensed therapist, that's a big deal. And I want to make sure that I can be confident to do that. Um, so there's some there's some liability in, in both roles. Can you maybe talk a little bit about, um, so having some, some of my questions come from taking the Institute that you all, you and Christina did earlier this year, which was immensely helpful. And honestly, a lot of why I did that was because as a group practice owner, I wanted to kind of have some additional lens on things I need to pay attention to and, and recognition of just having other people, even if they're contractors and highly independent, there's still some, where's my liability and where do I need to kind of provide that sure. teaching mentorship kind of thing? Um, sure. It os honestly also kind of probably spooked me out of wanting to be a future clinical supervisor, which I'm okay with, but it was just, it was really interesting to kind of have all that there. But um, to get back to, I guess my question is, um, one of the things you all talked about was just the developmental arc of a professional starting in school. So like the level of skills a practicum student might need compared to a first or second semester internship student, and then kind of a resetting of that, that arc again, once you graduate. So where a freshly graduated, newly minted associate level counselor is versus wrapping up to, to exit supervision, can you talk a little bit about how you envision that arc to go well and some stumbling blocks along the way somebody might encounter or as a supervisor, things to pay attention to? Yeah, I think um, when we think about supervision, meeting, I come from a developmental model of supervision, which Christina does as well, um, that as far as where you are on that trajectory, I'm going to interact with you differently. So. 
uh, you know, a practicum student is a baby. You know, they need a lot. They need a lot of uh, support. They need a lot of very direct, like do the, do the, you know, as far as interventions and skill. Um, they also need a lot around managing their own stuff and their own reactions to clients. And, you know, they've not built that skill yet of being able to be in a space with somebody who's not okay and still be okay. That skill hasn't happened for them yet. So, yeah, they need a lot, a lot. Um, and, yeah, and then internship students you know, it's a little less, they still need direct feedback around skills. Um, you can kind of get into this space of, you could do this, you could do that, you know, kind of giving several options. And for me, that kind of continues even into the provisional, um, right at the beginning, because the way the licensure board works, it could be three months, four months, six months before, between finishing graduate school and actually working. For some it doesn't, but, you know, um, there's a lot of factors in that process. So, yeah, it can feel like they're back in internship sometimes if it's been a big gap, which is fine. Like, there's, it just is what it is, part of the process. And especially, if, too, if they are also new to the agency. So it's not unusual if they're new to the agency, to also come to uh, their clinical supervisor with just very technical, sometimes admin questions. And uh, again, that's just part of it. And then, yeah, as they get into kind of midway through, especially there towards the end, it feels more like consultation, especially if they're good. You know, I've had some supervisees that we didn't get to that space. And then I've had others that it felt like we got to that space very quickly because they were top-notch clinicians. And so, yeah, at some point, in, especially towards the end, it does start to feel more like consultation, that it's more of this kind of back and forth. Um, have you thought about this? Um, you know, you might, I would do this. And, and I've had some come back and say, you know, I don't really think that would be helpful. Okay, that's fine. You know, and so it does get to that to that space um, of yeah, it's more about yeah that consultation piece than really about you need to do this or you miss this here. Or, and I see, I hear less and less tapes towards the end too, which I'm fine with um, because if I can speak to your skill, then yeah, we have I have less and less that I need to hear. How do you go about selecting who you're going to take on as a supervisee? Or I guess to, a second question to tag on to that is how did, have you ever had to decide this person's not a good fit for me as a supervisee and had to, to help them find a better fit? I actually had that happen pretty recently. <laughs> uh, but for your first question, how do I select uh, supervisees? I meet with, I meet with them first. If anybody reaches out, if it's somebody I don't know. So I have, of course, students from App State uh, with teaching adjunct up there that, you know, will reach out and say, Hey, and in that instance, I'm like, yeah, it's, you know, I don't need to meet with you. I know you, it's fine. If I don't know them, even if they're a student at App State and I've not, they've not been in any of my courses, I'll meet with them for 30 minutes, you know, for free. I don't charge for supervision console, like a console and talk to them about if they have a spot already, if they have a job kind of lined up, what is it? What's their goal? Uh, what's the population they want to work with? Um, talk about past supervision experiences, what was helpful, what was not helpful. What do you need from a supervisor? Um, and then I'll, I'll talk to them about how I do supervision, um, the specialty areas I have around feminist therapy and social justice and working with queer folks and, um, working with kids and, you know, just to see if it's a good fit. And then I also really pay attention to my gut. 
And if my gut is like, mm -mm, then I don't take them. I had an App State student that uh, they'd not been in any of my courses. I didn't really know them very well. And met him for the consultation. And it's like, this is not going to be a good fit. It's just not. And um, I also, one of my like kind of hard is I will not take a provisionally licensed person who's in private practice. It's too much liability for me. So um, a group practice is fine. I've got supervisees at group practices and that's totally fine. But somebody out here just out of graduate school that wants to start a private practice on their own, no, I will not be your supervisor. Because, uh, again, it's just too much liability for me. I'm not comfortable with that. So, so yeah, that's a hard no. Um, and, yeah, so I've had here recently, well, recently it was like early earlier this year, um, had a supervisee that um, I met with her and felt like a good fit. Um, she told me she was a, a group practice. And, so, and I mean, I can own that I didn't, I needed to ask more follow-up questions about that. And I didn't. So that's totally my mistake. Um, working with kids. Um, and I can't remember. I mean, we hadn't been doing supervision long. I'm going to say a month, maybe six weeks. And she had a client that came in kind of mild crisis. Um, client wasn't actively suicidal, anything like that, but was having some kind of passive suicidal ideation, you know, that kind of thing, which led us into a conversation about as far as their practice, what was their um, crisis plan? Like as a practice, you know, were they going to do their own crisis? Were they going to get with, uh, they ran a uh, county that Daymark Recovery Services was the comprehensive provider. I was like, are y'all going to partner with Daymark? Like, what's the plan? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what the plan is. What do you mean you don't know what the plan is? Like, that's playing with fire. So... There was also something else with that supervisor. There was like two things of why I eventually ended our supervision. It was that, and there was one other, and I don't remember what the other thing was. But, um, so I said, okay. I said, um, you know, definitely get with the owner and, you know, y'all, y'all need to figure it out by the next time we meet for supervision, you know, um, so, um, oh, I remember they were get. I was getting pushed back about getting raw data. That was the other one. And so I said, okay. Um, I said, by next supervision, at a minimum, I need to know what the agent, what the group's plan for managing crisis. Like, what's the plan? And come to next supervision, there was still no plan. And I still had not heard raw data. Um, the... <laughs> Again, this is where I should have asked more questions, which I can own. Part of this process, I found out the owner of the practice was also a provisionally licensed person. And mm -hmm. their supervisor was not making them get raw data. And so that's where the pushback was coming from. And they had no form as far as permission to record. And I was like, you know what? And I, I actually called Christina and got some... Uh, this, uh, some consultation and I just emailed the supervisee and I said, you know, I'm just not comfortable with this. Um, here's all the reasons why. Um, and you have two weeks to find a new supervisor. And they did. They found a new supervisor. We, um, I offered to have a closing supervision with them. They declined. And so I just filled out their final supervision report and sent it into the board. And that was the end of it. Um, so yeah, it really came down to, for me, the liability, like 
I'm not willing to risk my license, my reputation, my finances. I'm not willing to do that um, because you're at a place like a literal place, a literal group practice, group practice, loosely. Um, that doesn't have some of these very critical things in line. And so, um, so yeah, I ended that supervision contract within two months, probably. So for those listening, like, it is fair to say that the liability as a clinical supervisor is any of your supervisees' clients are also effectively your clients. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so for those of y'all out there listening, just keep that in mind. And for me, at least, one of the things, so also for listeners out there too, like I, I have Angela come in once a month for anyone that wants to attend my group practice to do consultation. And I've got a mix of fully licensed and provisionally licensed people and my provisionally licensed people have outside supervisors. And so it's just a way we can all kind of come together and talk through things. I also have, um, for my practice, kind of a panic call list. So Angela's on my, anyone in my practice can call Angela for anything. Like it's an expense that, um, if she wants to charge for her time, like I'm happy to pay for that as a, as a group practice owner, but just having a list of like four or five people you can staff a situation with as needed, as well as just having like a, here's a list of your local crisis numbers and what to do and when this might come into play and all of those other things. Um, as a side note, and this was something that a friend of mine recently asked about how to structure their shift into doing clinical supervision for people outside of their practice. And, while I was sitting there at your institute earlier this summer, I was thinking if down the road I want to do clinical supervision, I would, to keep the liability as separated as possible, um, I would likely end up setting up a separate, you know, LLC, PLLC to just do clinical supervision for anyone not on my group practice. And that way, if anything did happen, it doesn't jeopardize the livelihood of anyone in my group practice. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, um, yeah, being aware of that and how, yeah, because liability, when you take, when you get that S and you start offering supervision, that increases your liability. So, yeah, you want to make sure you're calling whoever's your liability insurance carrier to say, hey, I'm starting to do supervision. I need, you know, extra liability, need to have my plan, you know, whatever. Um, because yeah, anybody, any client that you, your supervisee has, if something happens, you are also in the line of fire. So you just want to make sure that you're covered as far as your liability. And yeah, you could do that. Like, I don't have a group, right? It's just me. It's just me out here doing my thing. So I just make sure that my liability insurance covers that I do supervision and so I don't need an extra, but yeah, like for folks that are in a position like you, where you have four or five, six, however many employees in your group practice, it may make more sense to just have a separate thing where you're doing um, specifically supervision out of that business. Going in network with insurance can be tough. I know when I took insurance, there were long wait times and it was so confusing. Filing all the right paperwork is time consuming and tedious. And even after you're done, it can take months to get credentialed and start seeing clients. That's why Alma makes it easy and financially rewarding to accept insurance. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access enhanced reimbursement rates with major payers. They also handle all of the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions and guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. Once you've joined Alma's insurance program, you can see clients in your state of licensure regardless of where you're working from. It's amazing to know that you can be fully online. Learn more about building a thriving practice with Alma at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. That's hello. A L M A dot com slash Joe to get started. 
So for other group practice owners out there listening, what would you recommend as far as just a baseline minimum in terms of thinking about things to have in place to accommodate situations and circumstances in a group that would be clinically supervision relevant type concerns? Yeah, definitely the crisis piece for sure. You know, who, how are you going to manage crisis? Are you going to do your own or say, are the clinicians in your practice responsible for responding to crisis of their own clients? Or are you giving out whoever the comprehensive provider is in your community or the LME MCO access line? You know, what's the plan for the practice? And how is that then communicated to clients? Is that on all your documentation? Is that um, on your voice thing? Client calls after hours? You know, how is how is it um, communicated and how often to clients have they accessed that? And and also with my licensure supervisees, 100% has to be in their PDS, that they're going over with clients at least in the first couple of sessions, you know, and then, of course, if it changes, you know, whatever. Um, so, yeah, crisis is the main thing for me um, so that I know how the practice is handling it. So then if a supervisee calls me, then I know, okay, you know, make sure you call, you need to call you know, whoever the mobile crisis provider is in the community. So that would be one. Um, you know, and it's nice if practices can pay for supervision. You know, that's always a perk for supervisees. And so how does that going to happen? Is it the supervisee pays me and the practice reimburses the supervisee? Do I send the invoice to the practice and they pay me directly? You know, however that works. Because I'm going to get paid. <laughs> I'm going to get paid for my services. I'm not doing out here doing free supervision. Um, what else? Is that? Definitely the consent. Uh, you know, in North Carolina, we have to hear raw data. The board says every session, like every supervision session, it doesn't happen. Um, for a variety of reasons, that doesn't happen. But there's got to be a document in the client's file that says they've given consent to be recorded for the sole purpose of supervision. And so a lot of, especially private or group practices, don't have that. It's like, how have y'all been employing people? I mean, but got to have that document so that we can, um, so that I can hear data. And if I can't and I have to do live supervision, that's more expensive for the supervisee. So, um, so yeah, having that document. One thing to add to that, because you also recommended having a, basically a something to confirm that any recordings were destroyed as well. Yeah, that can be helpful, um, especially for clients who are hesitant to being recorded or you know, of course, anybody that's involved with probation or DSS, you know, just not real keen on being recorded. And so I have, I have suggested that supervisees or practices have that just as another layer of protection that they can show the client, you know, here's our document that says this is only done for supervision. This was the day it was destroyed, you know, whatever. And that it in no way ends up in their medical record. Yeah, that can be helpful. It's not necessary, like you don't have to do it. Um, but it, it can help with that hesitancy for clients to be recorded. One thing that crossed my mind as we're talking about this, and it's just come up, unfortunately, it's come up in terms of seeing it on some of the Facebook forums and stuff from other people in the state about, and this is, a, I think, good segue to shift over toward a social justice lens as well. If you have a if you're if you are a supervisee and you have a rupture with your supervisor in a particular way. Um and I think actually why this came up in terms of thinking about this, you were mentioning I'm going to get paid for doing my services, but I also remember from your institute that 
you cannot withhold documentation of clinical supervision for non-payment from a supervisee, which there's a whole other long discussion that could be had about how licensing boards don't necessarily always have their professional's best interest in mind. Um, but can you can you talk a bit to, to anyone out there who is still under supervision about what they might pay attention to in terms of why they might want to switch supervisors or where there might be some kind of mistreatment and then ways to go about remedying that? Yeah. So it makes me think of kind of two different situations. Um, the first situation being when your supervisor is crap, you know, where they're not holding up their end of the agreement that, and I've heard, I've heard some, there are some shitty supervisors out there and it just enrages me. Um, you know, supervisors, supervisors who are canceling supervision, you know, and it's like, that really puts your supervisee then in a bad spot because if you can't get that rescheduled, they can't practice. If you've hit in North Carolina, if you've hit 40 hours, you cannot practice until you get supervision, you know? And so, um, you know, where that's happened like continually, you know, that, um, supervisees are not getting supervision. Um, and that documentation's not being turned into the board or documentation has been lost by the supervisor. Um, you know, all that. I mean, if it, if your supervisor is not fulfilling their end of the agreement, you have every right to say, this isn't working. Like I need a supervisor who can show up for me. And that can be really scary for supervisees because of the power differential. And so uh, sometimes it takes you know, finding that mentor, maybe from your grad program, maybe you had a great experience with a supervisor in internship or practicum and, you know, getting their feedback and help on how to uh, end that relationship in a professional way. Um, it's not OK. Even if the supervisor is not holding up their end of the bargain, we still want to end that professionally. You know, it's not OK to ghost a supervisor. You know, it's not OK to um, just disappear um so and you have every right to then let the board know like hey i'm having to change supervisors because of you know these reasons um the other part is when that i thought about when you asked the question is when the rupture happens and it needs to be repaired and can be repaired and the supervision relationship continues and that's where I think just generally speaking, we just don't do good with hard conversations. We just don't just as, as society in general. Um, but then you add in the supervisor relationship, the power differential, you know, and all that. It can be really hard to say as a supervisee to say to a supervisor, I'm not getting what I need from supervision, you know. and so. As supervisors, I think it's important to kind of just set that as a normal part of supervision. Like every, you know, every month or so, just asking, like, hey, you know, how's this working out? Are you getting what you need? You know, is there anything you need me to do less of, to do more of, to have that open conversation, to try to diminish that, um, that power differential? Um, and those can still be repaired and the supervision can still be fine, you know? Um, so yeah, that just having in those open conversations, it's okay to say, this is what I need. Okay, great. Let's do that. It's fine. I think more people need to hear that because I had, I had okay supervision, but there were definitely some things that looking back on it, especially now having gone through supervision training would have probably prompted me to like consider switching in all seriousness. But again, I'm, I'm happy with what I got, but I'm also happy to still have people like you to then still mentor me because I realized there were some deficits in that whole process. And that's not to say that I had a terrible supervisor. I just one of those, it would have been nice to hear 
there's more latitude or there should be more of an open dialogue about needs and having that addressed and and also having maybe a clear expectation of what to expect from a clinical supervisor post grad school because that's very different when you're meeting with somebody you know one hour every 40 hours worked versus having a three hour clinical field experience class of supervision plus on site supervision for another hour every week like there's a big difference there and how like its approach is different too yeah yeah and as a definitely as a, a feminist therapist a feminist supervisor somebody's very mindful of power and social justice and all the things is that i want i recognize the power differential and i want to diminish that as, as much as i can i mean i can't in no way is the supervision relationship ever going to be equal i mean that, it's just not um and I want, I mean, it's my value that my supervisees get what they need. And if they need, I don't know, if they decide that halfway through supervision that they want to be an expert in child-centered play therapy, I'm not the supervisor for you. And that's okay. <laughs> no hard feelings. No, I'm just not. You know, that's not. I can't do that supervision. It's not an area of expertise for me. Um, so, yeah, or if it's, you know, something's changed within the relationship and the supervisee feels it's not working anymore. Okay, let's talk about it. And if we can't repair it, okay, I'm happy to find you another supervisor. Um, and let's be professional about it, you know, and have some conversations. Because we would do that with clients. I mean, it's the same in some ways. So. A lot of this, from what I took away from the Institute, is it's parallel. But you also have mentioned, too, that it's a different skill set. And a lot of it's this is going to be more focused on how I always described count, or supervision to clients was like, it's counselors for counselors about counseling. And it's, you know... I may share something like an excerpt of our session or some other thing from that raw data standpoint, but they're not, whoever's listening to that as a supervisor isn't listening to what your content is. They're listening to my content in reference to yours. Yeah, that when I'm listening to um, a tape from a supervisee, yeah, I'm listening to what did the supervisee do with the content of what the client said? And did they totally miss it? Did they do really well? I mean, it, yeah. So it's, it's definitely about the process that's happening. And that is a different skill set than being a counselor. And if it, it is a shift in how I'm showing up in that session, I show up differently with my, I mean, different not whole different but being with my clients is very different from being with my supervisees it's a different part of my brain and so I'm calling on a different skill set and some counselors don't have it and that's okay you can be a phenomenal counselor and be a shitty supervisor it's different and just because you're a phenomenal counselor doesn't mean that you need to be a supervisor. And that's okay. So you mentioned social justice and having a feminist perspective. Um, from having taken legal and ethics with you at App State, which is how we first met, and I still have my notebook about how to navigate some of those decision <laughs> things that's sitting in my office, which is <laughs> six and a half, seven years later. Um and it has come in handy once or twice. Like I'll admit, like you were like, you'll keep this and it'll sit there and eventually you'll pull it out and, it, and once or twice it has come out. But um, as counselors, we're, we're and therapists in general, we're taught to just kind of not bring our own stuff into counseling in a way that's going to be disruptive to the therapeutic process. And also acknowledge that we're, we have biases, we're human, be aware of them is something I definitely remember G, like Jerry Miller mentioning over and over again. It's like, you are you have biases, just know what they are, know how they show up, and you can work through it. And so how, 
as therapists in general, and I'm going to generalize that way and, you know, take that professional identity and into the world, which you all seem like we have, there's a def- definite pressure I'll note about always feeling like we're always on regardless. And how do we then get to express our viewpoints? Like I know you've mentioned feminism and being an ally to um, lots of, lots of different folks in general, but how do we, how do we do that as counselors or therapists and still stay within, I guess, our ethical boundaries of things? And how does that maybe then show up with um, clinical supervision? I know different states have been passing some very unsavory legislation against the humanity of others. Mm -hmm. So how does, how do we navigate that? It's complicated. Mm -hmm. It is complicated. I think that's the best way to describe it. And that it's also multifaceted. So all of us, any licensed mental health folks, all of us within our ethics are called to be culturally competent and to advocate for social justice. I mean, so that's in our ethics. Like, that's expected of us as mental health professionals in the world. And so being mindful, I think we do have to be mindful of how we do that. Like, you don't want to be an asshole, you know. Um, and standing up for social justice. And um, it, it, it does put us in a sometimes a weird space, especially when that advocacy is fairly public. Um, and I think it's, yeah, just being mindful that, yes, I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor supervisor in the state of North Carolina. And um, I do things outside of that. And so sometimes that is advocacy. Sometimes that's contacting the paper about something. Sometimes that's showing up at a school board meeting. And, you know, and sometimes being very clear of what my role is. I had, I've had people ask me a question like, I know you're not my therapist, but I'm going to ask you that. I will answer their question. First, by saying, I am not your therapist, <laughs> you know, so uh, making it very clear. If I, yeah, I mean, I've contacted my local paper about stuff and make no mention that I'm a therapist, you know, so that there's sometimes little room for kind of confusion or, you know, whatever. And that does come into supervision, especially around advocacy, um, around in the community mental health system, there's a lot of shitty stuff that goes on in that system. And so sometimes that advocacy is not these big, I'm showing up in Raleigh or I'm going to this March or whatever. Sometimes it's, you know, going to your whoever, your HR person or your medical records person or somebody high up in the agency and saying, this is not okay. You know, what, what is going on here? Why are we doing things this way? Or, you know, whatever. So sometimes it's that, uh, how do I say, smaller advocacy, maybe it's for one particular client or, um, you know, you want to offer one particular kind of group and your agency is giving you pushback on it. Like maybe you want to offer a BIPOC neurodivergent adult group. And for whatever reason, you're getting pushed back from the agency or um, you want to do, uh, you want in your, in your agency's intake paperwork, there needs to be more um, inclusivity around names or pronouns or identities or, ethnicity so that you're ca- truly capturing what's going on for the client. Maybe that's an advocacy piece, you know, bringing in that social justice. Um, so, yeah. And so it comes into supervision sometimes around that kind of stuff. So what needs to happen? Where can you advocate within the agency? Um, and sometimes it is more public, like, you know, um, the shittiness that's going on in North Carolina right now. And, that uh, the laws that are now in place, the anti-trans legislation that we're seeing that has passed. And so it is a more public um, advocacy 
for some people. Some people are not comfortable with public advocacy, and that's fine. Um, you know, that's a comfort level. I think a big distinction I'm hearing is your. It sounds like you you are clear about or try to be clear about. I'm showing up from a counselor standpoint to advocate as a counselor from that perspective, or I'm showing up as a person and advocating as a person, as a human to fellow humans. And I happen to be a counselor in some capacities, but I'm not serving in that here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the context. And again, kind of making that clear. Can I throw out an ethical question? You don't have to like do a full answer, but um, you know, when it comes to our ethical codes versus legality, which is definitely something legal and ethics course we talked about a lot. It seems like it's an ongoing discussion. I know a, couple, a year or so ago when Roe v. Wade went down, there were discussions around what can we be compelled to as counselors have to disclose if someone lives in a state that, you know, is some procedures now illegal, similar kind of things for, for our field in currently like and in, in we both live in North Carolina I know Tennessee's got much more horrendous things going on although it's kind of a fine line of how much more horrendous it is because it's all pretty horrible but you know to to people out there client safety first and then how do you I'm sure there would be some scenario to where some judge could push back on things but I guess I guess the question really is like priorities like as a therapist with ethics where would you kind of like stand on things and take a stand and how far would you push it i guess is it Mm -hmm. yeah so when is the the legal and the ethical in conflict which is what we're seeing in north carolina i will preface by saying i'm i tend to be pretty radical (laughs) so um uh what i would do may not be comfortable for others and that's fine uh, some especially when it comes to this legislative violence we're seeing especially against trans people i think sometimes it really does does come down to as a counselor what are you personally comfortable with you know because there are ways to look at this and say i'm going to do this recognizing that this is potentially has consequences for me, you know? So, um, thankfully right now, the law in North Carolina that did pass did not specifically say mental health counselors. So in that perspective, we're saved for right now. And, but I do think it's a conversation that we need to be having, uh, if they come after us, which would not surprise me if they did, you know, they've gone after school counselors. But not surprise me if they come after us too. What are you comfortable with when it comes to that conflict of legal and ethical? I will say I talked to the board when there were bills that were being introduced that did target counselors that threatened our license, being sued, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Sage NC, which is a a division of our North Carolina Counseling Association, two of us there on the board went to the licensing board and met with the attorney and said, A, are y'all having conversations about this? And B, what do we do? They said, yes, we're very aware of what's going on. And they said, our job as a board, if you get a complaint, is to investigate the complaint to see if you were being unethical. We do not impose legal consequences. We don't impose legal fines, anything like that. Now, of course, they do if you are being unethical and they find that out. But they said, if you were following your ethics, that's what we look at. And they said, if we find no fault, that actually makes it harder for somebody to then go sue you because we're your licensing body. And we've said there is no fault in what you were doing. So there is some protection there with the licensing board. At the same time, you can still be sued. 
So again, that's not true in North Carolina for now. Um, and I think that with especially a lot of these laws as a counselor, really thinking about what am I, what consequences am I prepared to deal with if I take a stand and say, I'm not doing this. I don't care what the law is. I'm going to follow my ethics. Um, and I mean, we could do a whole nother thing about. I was going to say, like, this is like episodes worth of stuff. And there's some really awesome other podcasts out there that tend to address these types of issues um, more directly and more thoroughly. But it does sound like, for as um, sometimes contrarian and definitely as problematic as like the counseling board is in North Carolina, sometimes, like, it is nice that they actually did kind of address things that in terms of maintaining good standing from the board it comes down to your ethics which still could mean that you get to keep your license but maybe you still end up in jail or fined or yes end up in a court being sued by a parent or yeah um you know for me it was also encouraging that they know like they're paying attention and they had a plan you know if one of those really intense very targeted to counselors laws had gone through they already had a plan you know they would have an emergency meeting they would put out a statement they would say you know counselors don't do anything till you hear from us and that actually would have slowed down the implementation of the law because they are a government agent mm -hmm. like a government entity and so yeah it was just nice to know that oh y'all are paying attention yeah, you do know what's going on and you have a plan. It is interesting, the the legal government statute establishment of the board and also that it's kind of, it's legal and not legal, I guess, is mm -hmm. how the implementation goes in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of it's left up to different licensing boards, determinations and stuff. Um, so just, I guess, to maybe summarize things, if people are looking to kind of pursue or learn more about the clinical supervision route, what would you recommend that they do? Definitely look at your own board. What are the requirements? And be critical of the trainings that you look at. Um, there are some, you know, supervision trainings that, I mean, they're just not, they're just not, you know, they're not quality. They're not, um, they're not going to teach you how to do supervision. That's where I think our board gets it wrong. You should be, you should have supervision of your supervision. Um, not just take an online 45 hour course that you were able to pass the little exam at the end and now you can go be a supervisor. No. Nobody saw your skill. Nobody saw how you did supervision. So, yeah, get good quality training and have somebody watch your supervision. For listeners out there, both Angela and I are duly licensed with the Substance Use Board as well as the Counseling Board. And our Substance Abuse Board requires supervision for supervision. You are a, super, a CCS intern, basically. So you're you're provisionally licensed to provide supervision while you're learning how to be a supervisor, as well as the training that she mentioned as well. So I agree with that. And also I'm a big fan of um, having ongoing consultation of some kind too, because uh, it's helpful to talk through things and just also helpful to kind of serve as a check and balance. Um, I'm not for like restriction forever, but I do think it's something that should be maybe pressed a little bit more, and that's just my own bias on things. Um, if people wanted to advocate, especially just advocate, I guess, in our field, you're active. I know a lot of the App State faculty in general is really active at a state level. Um, is that a good place to start is to get involved in the regional and state level professional organizations and um find an area there's usually divisions although i know the north carolina counseling association's got a variety of different divisions depending on areas of interest whether it's spirituality or lgbtq um sorry if i'm not including all the letters um <laughs> i'm not sure what they all are anymore um so um but yeah just where are some good places that people could start 
advocating among other professionals and then if they were to like consider advocating outside of that any recommendations on resources on where to help them determine where their own boundaries and lines are with that yeah the state i think is a really good place to start um for anybody in the state the north carolina counseling association you can be a member of that and not be licensed so that's a good place. And we do have multiple divisions. Um, some of them are a little more active than others. Um, Sage and C, which is the one I'm involved in, um, you know, we've really been trying to keep people informed of what's going on. Um, we offer all kinds of um, meetings and they're all virtual at this point um, for people to get information. You can get on our um email list without being a member because we we just are passionate about things being accessible and correct information being out there so um and we're on linkedin and facebook and instagram and all the things so yeah so that's a good place to start lcc used to be lpc anc um they're also a good organization they don't have like the divisions and stuff and you do have to be licensed to be part of that organization um, but they also do a lot of advocacy. Um, all the other professions have state uh, organizations um, to keep up with legislation and um, get information about that. Um, Equality North Carolina is really good. They do a lot of town halls and, again, just trying to make sure people have the right information. Uh, the Campaign for Southern Equality, they partner usually with Equality NC. Those are really good to keep up with, um, especially again around the anti-trans legislation and the don't say gay and, and all that. Um, let's see, there was another one. Um, Planned Parenthood puts out some good information too. Um, not as often, but they do put out some stuff. Lambda Legal, ACLU, those North Carolina chapters. Um, following them on social media, things like that, you'll get some good information and they try to keep kind of things up to date. Um, yeah, all that kind of so, stuff. So some of that's more familiar, just kind of broader things like ACLU and things. And a lot of what you mentioned too are kind of more specific about just specific to either counseling or just therapists in general. And I think that's really cool too. Because in terms of listeners out there trying to determine how can I advocate in a professional and safe way? seems like that's kind of all very well thought of there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, depending on what, you know, your comfort level, you know, you can be a little more vocal or not. It just depends. Um, all these organizations need money, you know, so sometimes that's what people feel comfortable in doing, donating, not to like NCCA or anything like that, but like the Campaign for Southern Equality, Quality NC, the ACLU chapter, North Carolina chapter, things like that. Um, so sometimes that is a way to advocate social justice, you know, because money, organizations need money to keep doing what they're doing. So that's also can be helpful. Cool. Well, any takeaways for listeners that we haven't already touched on as we kind of wrap this up? I know we covered a lot. So if you're we still listening out there, thanks. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for hanging in here with us. But I, I mean, I would just say we're called as counselors to advocate for social justice and find out what feels authentic and comfortable for you and do that. And that's enough. Cool. Well, again, both of these are subjects that warrant a lot more time than we've had today. I really appreciate you coming on and kind of doing a very thorough but very also superficial level kind of you know survey of both of those things and um appreciate your time like always and perspective so thanks for coming on yeah yeah thanks for having me it's fun
Thanks for tuning in and listening to my podcast, Takeover for Practice with Practice. If you made it this far, thank you very much. If you'd like to talk more about our topic today and find out more info from our guests, please check out the episode description below. And if you're interested in learning about working with me, head over to practiceofthepractice.com slash apply and schedule a pre-consulting call. I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Thanks. We could not do our show without amazing sponsors like Alma. Alma's our sponsor today on this show, and they believe in giving tools to clinicians that can help them build thriving private practices. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days, access enhanced reimbursement rates with major payers, and also they handle all the paperwork and eligibility checks. Also, you're guaranteed to be paid within two weeks of each appointment. Learn more about building a thriving practice over at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. That's hello, A-L-M-A.com slash Joe to get started. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have an amazing day. We'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one.